Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of High Energy Girl. And today's amazing guest is Teddy Woolsey from Rebuild Fitness. Teddy teaches his clients how to sustainably lose fat, build muscle, and find the balance between hard work and joy in their lives. He is passionate about simplifying the fundamentals of exercise science, nutrition, behavioral science for his clients to promote long-term changes to their minds and bodies. Teddy is super smart, and I hope you, like I did, learn a few things from him. So let's go and say hello. Hey everyone, welcome to High Energy Girl, a podcast helping women to age stronger because it is never too late to get fit, be strong, and feel sexy. I'm your host, Tracy Gluhide, health coach and personal trainer and founder of highenergygirl.com. Each week we will either have a guest interview which will provide you encouragement or an actionable tip to help you age stronger, or I will do a solo episode. Please also join our awesome Facebook group called High Energy Girls, and I'm looking forward to see you on the inside of that group and hope you enjoy today's show. Hey everyone, this is Tracy and I have a special announcement. In order for me to help more women age stronger, I have created a 90-day one-on-one coaching program. And the goal here is to teach women over 50 how to age stronger while burning fat and boosting energy without going hungry or living in the gym. If you'd like more information, please hit me up at Tracy at highenergygirl.com or friend me on Facebook and send me a message. I have a goal of transforming a thousand women in the next year and I hope you are one of them. Hey, Teddy, thanks so much for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Good to be here. Oh, excited to chat with you. So for the listeners that don't know who you are yet, why don't you tell them a little bit about yourself? Yeah, who is this guy, Teddy? Um, I am literally uh, a a transplant out of uh, the southwest suburbs of Chicago, and I currently live in New York City. I'm an average guy who essentially had a... Uh, kind of 30-year-old life crisis and uh, completely changed, transformed my life for the better from a financial and physical perspective, uh, not to mention career and relationship. Um, But I tend to focus these days uh, on online fitness coaching, as well as uh, with a blend of life coaching, motivation, and evidence-based practices that I have learned and uh, implemented into my own life. And um, for my nine to five job, I also do B2B sales. So a little bit of everything, but uh, my main gig is, uh, and for the purpose of this podcast, is online coaching uh, for regular people just like me. Awesome. And so what inspired you to do that? Yeah, um, I've always had an entrepreneurial brain, I guess you could say. I was a very curious child and um, I knew that I was going to build a business someday and um, fitness was the thing that I, I I knew the most about from my childhood, but I didn't implement until I was later in, in life and essentially um, spent um, X amount of months just head in books, researching um refining my practice, build, finally uh, building a business of online coaching and, and et cetera. But it was more birthed out of an emotional sort of tumultuous situation in which I was completely out of shape, depressed, uh, had no plan on how to fix it. And um, uh, basically, again, uh, started doing a bunch of research and uh, applying, failing, refining, fixing it. Uh, then then uh, once I got my own house in order, um, my house being my body and my mind, uh, I was able to then formulate a business plan, uh, create the structure that I have now and, and rebuild fitness and, uh, and, and teach my uh, coach, my, my clients that I do today. So it was a very emotional, uh, tumultuous situation that created what, what I'm pushing now. That's usually what happens that whole dark night of the soul. <laughs> yeah. Um, well so what do you find most people these days are struggling when it comes to, I'm going to just say wellness because it's, you know, fitness, nutrition, everything. What do you find me, most people are struggling with these days? Consistency. Um, 
the research shows that most people who set out to lose weight, for instance, uh, they're successful. Um, anything, even, even 10% of one's body weight, uh, most people are successful for a short period of time. You can follow a 30, 30 day plan, a 60, 90 day plan. You can go to group classes and you'll see results. Uh, when you, when you move more and lose, um, uh, eat less. However, um, most people don't have that contingency plan for the weeks and months and years to come. And that's where I try. Uh, and I, I noticed that, that you do the same thing. This is kind of what we're looking to do is to create a slow, but consistent and sustainable um, fitness lifestyle for people where they don't emphasize speed, they emphasize results. Mm -hmm. One of my things I like to say is you want to maintain your weight the same way you lose it. Very well said. Yes. You I know, agree with that. that way you don't gain it back, you know? So consistency, why do you think people struggle with consistency? Well, it, it's, we have a short attention span with almost everything in life. You know, we can't even watch TV without being on our phones as well. But I think the, the struggle that I had was, was a few different factors. Um, even, even though I had a proclivity for going to the gym, working out, my dad was big in the gym when I was a kid and I, you know, I was, I was an athlete, all these sorts of things. Um, I, I, I had that familiarity piece, but I didn't really have the knowledge on how to pivot when things weren't going my way. And what I mean by that is let's say you're, let, let's, let's say you're me. And, and th this is a true story, right? From, from my own experience. Um, I wanted to lose 25 pounds and I, I thought, okay, I'm going to do this. I'm going to try to put on muscle. And, and I thought I'd be able to build muscle and lose fat at the same time consistently with, with perpetuity, right? No end in sight. Well, the body doesn't really work like that. You, it, at some point your body, you can't continue to lose fat and build muscle forever because your body needs um, a surplus of energy in order to sort of continuously build muscle. You can do so for, most people can do so for about six to nine months. Somebody who's obese can do it for even longer. But the point of the matter is for me, my body was just rejecting it and I would get frustrated. And I would say, you know, you know what, I'm just going to try to build muscle again. And I'm just going to accept that and be happy with that. And I was just constantly pinballing back and forth between this. I have too much body fat on my, on my body to feel like I've achieved my body fat percentage goals or, or like fit well in my clothes. But now I'm feeling, uh, I'm also feeling weak. So what do I do? Which direction I go? So I, again, I was in this limbo stage for years and years and I didn't understand why I couldn't get out of it. So I did research. I, I thought, I figured out, oh, okay, this is what the body does. This is how the body reacts. And you have to basically choose a path of getting down to a, a certain body fat percentage and then growing from there. At least that was my particular strategy. Once I learned that, I put together a plan from a dietary perspective, a exercise perspective, and also a forecast of how long approximately that would take so that I wasn't driving myself crazy thinking that I had to get these results in two weeks, two months, or whatever it may be. And it's that planning, it's, it's, the, it's the, okay, what do I want, right? It's the educating myself to understand what to expect and then, of course, it's building a plan that actually uh, matches those things that allowed me to sort of execute with better, more predictable and reliable results. And then, of course, when I failed, I knew what to do to um, correct course. OK, so but I, let's get back to this consistency piece, because I think this is super important. Yeah. I believe that people do what they prefer. And so helping them prefer to eat healthy, helping them enjoy the way they feel going to the gym, um, I think would be really helpful. Don't you? Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, um, I'm sure our approaches are, are going to be slightly different, but the outcomes are, are sort of the same, right? Which is, um, I want my clients to feel eventually to feel like, Hey, I'm, I can go in the gym. And even though I feel awkward now, um, and I feel out of place, or I feel like people are watching me, they recognize that, Hey, this is part of the process. And that, this is something we walked them through, right? It's just like, it's like, Hey, everybody feels weird sometimes. Like, um, even myself, like doing, you know, 
but Bulgarian split squats, split squats look very weird. Every single person, you know, like you're not alone. Um, but eventually you're going to become more custom and familiar to it. And once, when, once people are familiar and, uh, uh, comfortable with something, they're more likely to go back again and again and again. So there's that threshold that you have to pass through, but I agree with you is teaching them, um, a way of life that sort of gives them, um, or it allows them to to sort of do the blocking and tackling necessary to get those physical results and mental results. Um, that's that's really really important. But every single person is different, and there's many many ways to skin a cat. I actually hate that phrase. I don't know why I used it, but <laughs> <laughs> a big animal lover, something like that's a horrible phrase. The point of the matter is, um, it's this. The outcome is the same, right? You should not be trying to force yourself or will yourself to like. Uh, the way you eat, the way you move, et cetera, every single day for the rest of your life, because that is a recipe for failure. Yeah. But I do find that like for me personally, I love the gym. I mean, I love it. I even started going on my day off because I just like that consistency, that routine. And I think if, if we are able to help people fall in love with something, then it's easier. Like I, did a survey recently and consistency was a big thing. Motivation was another thing. And mm-hmm. so I feel like that's root cause, right? The motivation to find the consistency is the root cause of why people would rather sit on the couch and eat a bucket of popcorn, you know, that or something or sleep in and not get up and feel good, you know? Sure. Sure. So what would you There's... say to that? Like, how do you help motivate your clients? Yeah, there, there's this is kind of the education piece of of how our brains work, right? BJ Fogg, um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with him, but he's essentially uh, he's a he's a Stanford professor, and he created the Stanford Behavioral Lab, and he wrote a, a really fascinating book that a lot of uh, habit experts, including James Clear and others, have sort of emulated their teachings by, and that is that uh, he created this model that essentially says. Behavior is made of three parts, uh, a prompt or a trigger, uh, the ability to, it's easy, difficult, somewhere in between, and your motivation, right? So we sort of think of motivation as the, like kind of this, this large umbrella, but really behavior falls in, uh, uh, behavior is the umbrella and it's made up of three parts. And it's, again, it's, it's uh, think of, think of you're walking into your kitchen and there's a jar, a clear jar of M&Ms sitting right in the middle of your kitchen, Right. You walk in and you see the jar of M&Ms. That's a prompt. That's a trigger, right? The ability to go open that jar of M&Ms and eat them is very easy. So, you know, if you're looking at this as, as like a graph, it's it's like prompt is really high, ability is really high. And then the motivation is those M&Ms taste really good. I like M&Ms. I'm hungry or whatever. So it's very easy to follow through on that particular behavior because the prompt, the ability and the, and the motivation are all very high or at least high enough to consistently go do so. But if you don't want to eat M&Ms on a regular basis, or, Hey, you know, you're, you're seeing a little uh, added weight on, on the hips and you want to get rid of that. Well, what do you do? You have to lower the, uh, you have to make uh, the, the prompt go away or difficult to, to be triggered by it put it in, put it somewhere else, put it, get it out of the house, whatever you got to do to remove it uh, from the situation. So that prompt or trigger doesn't even start. Um, Again, make the ability more difficult, right? Put it in a a high shelf where it's still there. You don't, you you still want some sometimes, but it's, it's further away or it's more difficult to get. And then the motivation level probably stays the same. If you see M&Ms, you, you still want them, but you've taken away the first two of the three parts of a behavior. So you are more, much more likely to reduce your intake of M&Ms on a consistent basis because you manipulated those three things, right? So that's where I, I think motivation is extremely important. But when I talk to my clients or, and even self-talk of like, Teddy, you're really struggling to wake up early. Okay, how do I assess um, my prompts my ability levels and my motivations to wake up early and be productive in the morning. So I kind of like start dissecting that with myself and my clients in order to uh, improve the behaviors. Love it. 
That is brilliant. So that's exactly like me, like with sweets and stuff. Well, I don't eat touch them anymore. I have a zero sugar policy, but I used to like my mother-in-law is a big baker and she would always come over on the weekend and there'd always be leftover something, you know? And so because I didn't want to even look at it and have to grapple with that, you know, should I, or shouldn't I type thing, I hide it in the lower oven. (laughs) So (laughs) Out of sight, out of mind, right? Exactly. So that's really good. I like that idea of the prompt. Like with my clients, I tell them, clean out your pantry, get rid of anything that calls to you, you know, because yeah. if it's not there, you can't eat it. So, but going to the gym, like, or going to work out when you work with, with your clients, are they working out at home with you or are they going to the gym? That's a great question. So we have an on-demand program, which is, um, it, it's meant to integrate. So I, I am not working out with them live. Every client has a different program. It's customized, et cetera. The premise is to immediately start integrating exercise to your schedule and your environment. And what I do is I teach uh, my clients to follow the what, when, and where of exercise. And that means is um, you need to have a program that you're following, even a very simple one, because uh, so, so, hey, uh, is this, um, am I doing this with resistance bands? Am I doing body weight workouts? Am I doing some, some combination of weights or, or strength training? Whatever it is, have structure to it so that you know what, what you're going to do when you get to that time to work out. Reason, the reason being is the research shows that if you're going in and you're already motivating yourself and pushing yourself to exercise, but you have no plan to execute when you get there, the mental fatigue is going to overwhelm you and you're more likely to quit and, and burn out. So following a program, whatever it is, is extremely important. So we have, we have programs for all three. So gym, home, bands, body weight, whatever you want. So that's the what part, right? The when and the where is also something that's extremely important. There's a, there's a concept called implementation intentions that James Clear writes about, but I'm sort of kind of paraphrasing here. There was a study in 2001 from a British journal of psychology, I believe, where they did a two week study of people. It was something like 258 participants and they had three groups. One group was the control group. The second group was a group that read educational and motivational materials on uh, fitness, on, uh, you know, nutrition, and just the benefits of of being healthy, right? And working out. And then the third group, uh, they absorbed that information, but they also did one thing. They wrote down which days of the week they were going to work out. Okay. So interestingly enough, out of the three groups, the first group, which is the control group. And the second group that read the educational materials, they actually had these same results of showing up and working out once per week. It was about 38%. And actually the second group was about 36%, meaning 36 and 38% of that population, they showed up to work out once per week. The third group that read the educational materials and just simply wrote down when they were going to work out, they completed an exercise one at least once per week uh, 91% of the population. So they more than doubled their chances simply by writing down on a piece of paper when they were going to work out. So what I do with my clients and I'm even myself is I set the days during the week and the times during the day as my holy exercise time. I'm doing that no matter what anybody says, this is basically like my most important meeting of the week. And I set it and I'm far more likely to complete it. What I also tell my clients to do and, and, and myself is try to use a tactic called sandwiching, which is effectively taking two activities that you have throughout the day that are already stable. Say you have morning meetings and you have afternoon meetings, but you have an hour lunch. That is the perfect time because you're already in go mode. You have the same schedule every day. Just slip that exercise right in there so you don't have to wake up earlier. You don't have to do it when you're tired after work and you will have consistency because you already have two established activities that you're doing and you're just implementing a new um, activity within the two, right? Extremely, extremely effective. And the last piece, I'm almost done here, I promise you at this point, is the where, right? And that that's kind of going along with the with the what piece. It's like 
okay, if I'm following a gym based program, I have to follow a workout at the gym, or if it's going to be at home, it's going to be okay, I have this equipment to do so. So when you have all those pieces together, a program to follow, where I'm going to do it, that ideally is creates as little friction as possible. So if you have a gym that's 30, 30 minutes away every day, and it's the greatest facility in the world, but it's still 30 minutes drive, you're less likely to go. So you'd, I'd rather you work out at home and get consistent workouts in than get the best workout in once a month because you hate driving there and back, right? right? So what, when, and where, when those all three come together, you have a very, very strong recipe for fitness consistency, particularly from the exercise side. Yep. Totally agree with that. I, uh, I used to be a 5.30 am or <laughs> you know, alternating between boot camp and the weight room. And then I found a new gym and now I go at seven, but I believe that you want to make it so it's not hard to do, you know? Yeah. So, it sounds like you, it sounds like you have a lot of motivation and familiarity with the gym that you've, that you've built up over the years, right? Like you, you sound like genuinely, like you really enjoy it. You feel good about it and, and all these sorts of things, which is why your, your motivation levels probably are so high these days, including myself, that it, it, uh, the schedule piece and the other prompt and the, the triggers and the ability levels, it's not so important now because it's like, we're so happy doing it. Right. So right. what we do, what we do with our clients is we're trying to get them to that piece or that stage, um, by, by planning better and so on and so forth, and just helping them become that state of, or get to that state of mind that we have now, because that is a mm -hmm. state of true lifelong consistency. Yeah. And it's just helping them find the, the passion about it because the alternative of, you know, growing old and sickly to me is not an option, yeah. you know? So I love what you just said. I mean, that is, that is key as you got to know what you're going to do. And when, I mean, blocking out your schedule, like a, I really think self-care is important for people and blocking out what you can do to also love yourself and support yourself, even outside of the gym or cooking healthy. But that brings me to another yeah. question. What is your take on nutrition? What's your secret sauce with the nutrition? Like, what are your top three things that you recommend people do? I saw oh, you drinking man. water. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, th this is, this is where I sort of, I don't know if this is a point for, or in my favor or against it, depending on who I'm talking to, I suppose. But, um, the three main things that I try to hit are water. Indeed. Uh, I, I, for my clients, at least I say, listen, at least one milliliter per calorie that you're consuming. That's kind of the gold standard of what you should be, should be hitting every day. Um, water does so I consider water kind of like that reset button on a phone or a laptop or something like that. If it's not working, you are feeling kind of mental fatigue, you're feeling overheated and you need to self-regulate, just chug a bottle of water. I guarantee you, you're going to get at least, at least 40% feel a little bit more uh, reset than you were before. So water's so huge. one milliliter. Okay. So let's break this down. Cause that I've never heard this before. One milliliter per what? Per calorie consumed each day. So my goal of calories is 1600 calories and one milliliter. How many liters would that be? I'm going to do that right now on my phone. That's a great question. As far as like ounces, right? <laughs> um, so it would be, it would be, you said 1600, so 1600 milliliters, um, milliliters to ounces would be 54 fluid ounces. So that breaks down to oh, two liters, less than two liters. Oh, I drink way more than that. Yeah. Okay. It, that's the minimum, right? Like we should, we should be hitting that. And, and, and a great way to like drink more water, by the way, for, for your listeners is um, <clears throat> if you if you like like drinking water or you don't have a problem with it, but you're just like, oh, I just forget um, buy you know, buy water bottles. I'm sorry, plastic, you know, recycling people. I'm a big whatever. But like my point is take water bottles and place them in places around the house that you walk by and just allow your allow you your your environment to trigger a response to you to pick up that water, open the, the the bottle and drink the water, right? The reason is that using that same PAM prompt ability motivation model is that 
where motivation to drink water is high. We want to feel good. We, we don't want to not or to feel dehydrated or anything like that. It's just, you know, things happen during the day, but make it easy on yourself by setting up your environment to just be like, oh, whoops, there it is. Boom. It, I, I don't even have to think about it. And I, I'm drinking more water. That's something that I, that my wife has done. And she is drinking three times the amount of water that she did before feeling much better, et cetera. So that's one little tip on the water, by the way. Okay. So I'm going to say, uh, not because of the, well, re- recycling, but I don't, I'm not a fan of plastic water bottles just because of the plastic leaching into the water. Um, and I'm more of a fan of glass or stainless. Because, totally true. I mean, and you got to remember, I'm 57. What, you're, what are you, like 37, even if that? <laughs> 30, 34. 34, yes. 34. So, I mean, just the studies I've done with that, that's all I do. Like, I drink out of these jars all the time. And they actually, you can get nice lids for them. So perhaps, great. you know, they can have jars of water and then that way they know it's not dead water. Like how long has that water been sitting in a plastic bottle? That That is a great a question. A year or two, you know? Yeah, that's a fair point. Uh, that's something I don't even really think about because I'm just a simple caveman brain sometimes. But I, I you know, we're, 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 uh, between the two of us, we're going to come up with the perfect solution with, for this water. But I think it's like, you're absolutely right. You know, have three, four uh, glass or uh, stainless steel bottles around the house, fill them up each day or whatever it may be. Just set them in the places that you normally walk by. Same concept, right? And, set, and, and then don't drink the nasty plastic, you know, water in general. So that makes sense yeah. to me. Cool. Sorry, I don't want to like counter what is it contradicted anything you're saying? I just Please. really want people to stay away from plastic because yeah, plastic's just, and I didn't know this. I was the soccer mom that had three kids that had like a whole case in the back of my car all the time, you know, my <laughs> SUV, and then it would get hot. And, Oh, I learned so much when I started studying nutrition, but had to break a lot of habits with my kids at that time. So listen, you're, you're, this is good. I, I am totally at any given point. I am fully ready to accept that I got something wrong and I am glad I love to be corrected. In fact, research shows that we learn better and we retain that information better and put it into long-term memory, long-term memory faster by um, getting a question wrong and being corrected by it rather than, than thinking that, you know, the whole time or never being corrected. So um I, I, it's that little jarring effect of being like, and now my brain's open to a new answer. If I'm willing to accept that uh, this, I'm definitely probably going to go buy a couple of like reusable uh, glass jars and set it around the house now from Amazon. So you inspired well, me. First of all, you're a very smart kid. I mean, not, not to demean you, but you're, you're a young and smart <laughs> young man. How's that? But also, I'm glad you said that because somebody came on my show once and they beforehand wanted to know if we were aligned. And I'm like, mm-hmm. I don't need to be aligned. How, how am I ever going to learn anything new if I think that I know it all already? <laughs> yeah. You know? So, e- echo chambers don't help anybody uh, at all, uh, inside or out. So, yeah, I would rather... Um, I'd rather take the posture of, yeah, I, I could be wrong about... I feel strongly about this or I feel... Ex- you know, I feel a certain way about it. I, I think that I'm right based on all the information I have, but somebody comes along and says, you know, Hey, these are logical facts that like are indisputable. And I'm 100% ready to accept that. That's, that's so important for us to have that natural curiosity and fluidity of, um, of new information. If we're not, mm-hmm. I mean, what are we doing? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't claim to know everything. I have an opinion today, but that opinion can change tomorrow. Who knows? So sure. Anyway, all right, finish your nutrition stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So so water for sure, right? Um, the the two other pieces would be energy balance, right? I mean, that, that's really the most, one of the most basic things we know about um, uh, weight loss gain, um, body weight manipulation, you know, muscle growth, et cetera, is, is energy balance. So, you know, at the end of the day, um, there's a lot of factors that go into uh, weight maintenance or weight management. 
Uh, but a lot of rights, excuse me, a lot of wrongs can be righted by uh, uh, achieving a healthy level of body fat um, that is, you know, uh, subcutaneous and otherwise. But um, I am, I am just a huge proponent of, of sticking to the basics of like, hey, listen, you've got to be in a calorie deficit if you're looking to lose uh, uh, weight consistently. Again, there's other factors from hormonal imbalances and that sort of thing. But the truth, the, the bare, uh, the baseline is that, and the first law of thermodynamics is that uh, you've got to be in a calorie deficit in order to lose body fat. That's how it works. So I, there's, uh, when I teach macronutrients and supplement, supplements and vitamins and that, those things outside of it, those come tangentially, uh, those are important as well. But I, I always try to like start people off, uh, get, like step into the pool with energy balance, and then we'll go into the deep end with like all of these other uh, next level things and so on and so forth. But that's, that's like, um, I should say fitness and nutrition 101. The third piece would be protein. Um, I am actually going to be releasing an article very soon about what's important about protein, why it's important, but just to give you like a synopsis or your, your listeners a synopsis, as I'm sure you, you already know, is that, uh, protein is really the primary macronutrient we need in order to, uh, build tissue, body tissue in general. So uh, that includes of course, muscle mass, but when you, uh, our, our bodies are constantly breaking down, uh, 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 proteins and, and muscle, uh, all the time, we're constantly breaking it down. The goal is to, uh, at least match that muscle breakdown rate with muscle protein synthesis, which is aided by protein consumption. Um, and of course by, uh, exercise overloading our muscles, etc. So the goal for myself personally, I'm trying to put on more muscle mass. So I'm trying to exceed my, uh, the, the protein, excuse me, the muscle protein breakdown with muscle protein synthesis so that I am putting on muscle mass and protein consumption is such a huge and absolutely necessary piece of doing so. Um, it's just about how do you get adequate amounts of protein, whether it's through your natural diet, through supplements, et cetera. And I, I certainly understand the plight of individuals that you know are vegetarian and vegan um, and then struggle with that consumption without animal proteins or uh, um, uh, dairy products and that sort of thing, but I even help with with that and and so on and so forth. So, protein is extremely important. That is the short answer. <laughs> so, how do you determine your protein intake goal based on your weight? Yeah, yeah, really, really good question. So, I don't necessarily do it by weight. I do it by calories consumed. So, if you're in a, a calorie deficit for the purpose of fat loss. Um, then I do it very, very, very simply, um, with the exception of individuals that have, uh, extremely, um, an extremely high to total daily energy expenditure, um, or extremely low, the protein consumption for me is right around anywhere between 30 and 40% when you're in a caloric deficit. Um, I just try to keep it as simple as possible for folks to just hit that number. And we try to find ways to integrate that into their diet. Um, and then of course, ideally we'd love to get like refine it a little bit better and, and break those down more easily. But that's about where I try to, to, uh, end for myself in particular with protein. So how do you calculate the calorie amount that they're consuming? Sure. Um, so it depends on the rate that they want to lose, maintain, or gain weight, body, body fat in particular. So, uh, what I'll do is if, um, uh, if a person is, you know, based on their, their biomarkers, you know, their age, their sex, their activity levels, th their height, um, et cetera, if they are, let's say consume, uh, 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 their total daily energy expenditure, which is essentially for, for your listeners, um, all of the calories that you burn through all of your activity, non-activity, everything all day long. If it's, if that number is 2,500 a day and you're looking to lose weight at X amount of rate per week. Maybe I'll put you on a diet uh, where you're aiming for a daily average of, of let's say 1700, 1800 calories a day, right? From there, because we know that pro, uh, one gram of protein equals four calories, 
effectively, we would either break it down by calories. So if we're looking for 40% of, of 2,500 would be, I can't do the math off the top of my head. I think it's something like, I, I actually, I could do it right well, now. Well, wait, um, you said you'd put them on a 1,700 calorie diet a day. So you're actually decreasing their calories by 800? Yes. Thank you. That's the number, the figure that I was looking for, right? But that's an example, right? It just, it depends on how, how quickly somebody wants to get there or how slowly somebody wants to get there. So say, let's make it easy for yourself. So they, so they're, and they measure it like with an aura ring or with an iPhone or a Fitbit or something. Is that how they measure their out? Well, no, my fitness pal doesn't measure your output. It would be a Fitbit or an Apple watch or an aura ring or something that measures your output, right? Absolutely. So I've used them all. I'm a big fan uh, personally, just for, for a lot of reasons, what they do. What I try to do, however, is establish a baseline for the first month based on uh, the, um, uh, I think it's called the St. Jour equation, uh, which is basically the gold standard for um, the Mifflin St. Jour equation, which is the gold standard for total daily energy expenditure. And it's the figures that a lot of these, these watches and devices go by. Um, based on somebody's regular activity, right? So if, if somebody's estimated to work out four times a week, there's a calculation for that. So I basically work off of those numbers and we establish a baseline for a month. For that month, um, when we consume 1,800 calories a day and we're assuming that they're burning 2,500 calories a day, again, these are weekly averages uh, or daily averages over the course of a week, then we can safely assume that they are in a deficit of, I think we said, you know, 1,800, 20, so 700 calories a day. We can safely assume. Theoretically speaking, if all the math and the, bio, the biology was exactly right, you could expect uh, a person to lose about one body fat, one pound of body fat per week. That's just what the math says. Now, of course, it never works out perfectly easily like that. Sometimes we overestimate what we, what we, I have burned and we underestimate what we've consumed and, and all these factors. But the goal in our, in really what I teach in my programs are to work off of some sort of baseline of data so that we know what's working, what's not, and how we can pivot with actual reference points rather than based on feelings, emotions, et cetera. So that's kind of where we land in that regard. And just to answer your original question, um, if somebody's consuming 1800 calories a day, um, and we're, we're looking for, you know, what, 40, 40% of that, about 720 calories a day of that 1800 would be made up of protein or to put it even more simply about 180 grams. Wow. Okay. So I, uh, my That's 40%, goal, that's the high end. My goal is 125 grams of protein a day. Um, and if I eat more than that, I feel stuffed. Yeah. Like I just can't, I can't do it. And I even just recently upped my protein and, um, it was down to like, I don't know, 85 or 90 before. Mm -hmm. And my trainer's like, you've got to get it higher. So what's your favorite? Oh, go ahead. You said, you said 500, uh, so, so 140 grams you said per day. 125 is my goal. Excuse me. Okay. So 125 is your goal, right? So let's just do the math really quickly. 125 times four uh, calories per gram would be 500 calories out of your 1600. I think you're aiming for, right? Yeah. 25%. So that's a fine range. Like the, the um, Mayo Clinic suggests, I think somewhere anywhere between, I think it's like 12 or something percent up, up to like 40 or whatever it is. Now that's the Mayo Clinic, whatever, but you're, you're exercising on a regular basis. You're actually breaking down muscle tissue. So you, you need to consume even more protein. So 25% and your trainer's right, right? 25% is very adequate, I think. And you're hundred percent. That's, that's so normal and, and, and reasonable to feel full on high protein foods because they rank typically very high in the satiety index, which is effectively um, you, you know this, uh, but for your listeners, is effectively measured by foods that have pro, uh, high protein content, uh, measure as very filling and uh, lasting in a uh, long lasting in energy. There's like these markers that that list it that way. So you think low fat milk, low fat cheese, lean meats, um, a lot of legumes, 
uh, beans, things like that, that are very, very filling. The energy lasts from them a while, but you think of like chicken or uh, egg whites in particular is like, um, is, is 90 on a scale out of a hundred. Uh, spinach is a hundred out of a hundred. There are foods literally that are measured in a lab of their, how uh, filled, uh, how filled you will be per thousand calories that you consume of it. And when you're eating more protein, you are naturally going to feel more full on a regular basis. If again, your protein intake is high. So that's another reason why people promote it is like, Hey, not only does it have all these physical benefits, but it really helps you to keep your calories low because they're so filling. Mm -hmm, for sure. And I drink aminos, um, before yeah. my workout and after my workout, I do aminos. I had a guest on the show who was 70 and he was a vegan Ironman athlete and his gut lining was trashed, um, because oh, he no. wasn't getting enough protein to repair and he's a doctor. Um, but his, his aminos are amazing. Um, so, so, so good. And so I do the electrolyte aminos as well. So, okay. What about protein sources? What are your favorite protein sources? Sure. Um, so for, for meat eaters, uh, you can't go wrong with like chicken breast, um, lean beef. Uh, I don't eat pork personally, but you know, uh, even like pork loins are very, very lean, um, uh, high on the satiety index. Then you've got your dairy products. Uh, I am a huge proponent of egg whites, liquid egg whites. They are cheap. They are, you can get cage free. Um, they're extremely high in protein compared to the fat and carb ratio, uh, compared to a, a standard whole egg it is more filling per calorie and gram. Um, I, I can't say enough about egg whites. I know they don't taste amazing, but that's what seasoning is for. That's what other uh, uh, compliments uh, in the dish are for, et cetera. But please, if you are not leveraging egg whites, you are, you're, you're, please start doing so. Your body and your bank account will thank you. Um, I'm a huge, uh, so big fan of that way. Fair Life Milk, even though they were in the news a couple of years ago for one farm that did something really bad. They kicked that farm to the curb and they actually are a fairly de decent company. Um, it is lower calorie, more purified milk, um, and it's higher protein per, per ounce. Um, so those are dairy products, but then you think of, um, you think of like, uh, vegetarian options. So Seton, uh, S E I T A N, uh, Tempa, uh, tofu is also a pretty good option, but the way they created, I'm not like a huge fan of it. I'm, I'm only doing recent re research on that. Uh, but you think of like lentils, edamame, uh, those are really great sources. Uh, if, if you love Indian food, which I do, uh, paneer, it's very high in fat and dietary fat, but it's also very high in protein. But again, if it depends on your preferences, that's a great way to get, um, some really delicious high protein options, cottage cheese. Um, gosh, I hope, and then of course you, you can't beat just standard protein supplements, right? You think of like, uh, just gold standard whey protein. <clears throat> that's about, <clears throat> excuse me. That's probably the best bang for your buck from a price perspective and quality perspective without a ton of additives. But then of course, naked protein and naked pea protein, you're going to pay a little bit more, but, uh, they are, it's, it's probably the, the highest quality purified, clean, uh, protein source, uh, protein powder source that is on the market that I'm aware of. Have you tried equip build? Equip build. No, I haven't. So that's the protein I use. It's three ingredients, grass fed beef, protein, cocoa powder, and stevia. That's it. And it tastes amazing. That's awesome. Uh, I ne never heard of it. And, and it's such a huge industry. So it's a great place to sort of experiment and try little samples. If you go to GNC or vitamin world, you'll find that they, these, these folks, uh, they want to sell their products. So they'll, uh, they'll give you samples to try and go home and then, and then you can get little deals here and there. But yeah. Um, I, so funny, funny, you should mention Stevia. I am personally, um, I am not, I am not particularly drawn away from artificial sweeteners, uh, whether they're lab grown or stevia, which is natural. Stevia actually gives me uh, headaches and it kind of, um, 
I, I overheat from it. It's a weird reaction personally, but that's, weird. it's, it's, you know, every person is different and that's totally okay. Um, with that said, I, I'm just bringing the, the point up that <clears throat> um, of the research that I've done on the subject and the, and the, the people that I follow uh, from a uh, nutrition uh, perspective at the highest levels and the most respected levels that, I, that I'm aware of, particularly uh, Dr. Lane Norton and, and uh, you know, folks like that, um, they, they have proven to me that there's nothing that we know of right now from artificial sweeteners that shows uh, any sort of negative uh, effects long term. Now, they're fully aware that we could find out something very soon that, that shows differently. So I particularly uh, am not against it. I love my Diet Coke. It just gives me like that nice little fill, filled feeling, et cetera. Or if you want to do something even better without any aspartame in it or any, any uh, artificial sweeteners, think of like a um, uh, carbonated uh, water with like the essence of a fruit. Um, LaCroix, for instance, right? Yeah. Uh, the the cool thing about carbonated drinks, if you want to feel full, is mm -hmm. that the, the way that you your body and your brain uh, detects carbonated drinks is uh, the carbonation makes your brain think you are more full and there's more food in your body than there actually is. So if you're looking to curb a craving for the just a short term uh, time, there is uh, options like that. And it's literally just carbonated water with like drops of fruit uh, or, 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 you know, pomegranates or little things like that. That's just strong enough to, you can feel the flavor, but it's not overpowering and it's definitely not juice. It truly is zero calories and there's no, there's no additives at all. So I have a, um, a bubble maker soda stream. I've had it for yeah. years. Those are the best. And honestly, now I just prefer it plain, but I feel like it's really good to just squeeze fresh lemon or lime in it. Um, instead of, the natural flavors from those. I still drink mm -hmm. LaCroix. I, I like it, but, um, but I like the bubble water just as much. And then you're not getting the aluminum from the cans. Yeah. So, yep. and then if you like diet Coke, okay. My husband used to be a diet Coke head and, um, but I switched him to Zevia. It's Z E V I A. Yes. No color. So no artificial colors. It doesn't have all the stuff in it that Coke has in it. And that's all anybody in my family now drinks. They don't drink Coke anymore. Is Zevia? Oh, no, I'm thinking of the old, the old, old, old. Um, I think it was like one of the first carbonated like uh, uh, seltzer beers or something like that. But no, I, I know what you're referring to. I, I've seen it in the store and I will definitely have to try that out. And the, the great thing, just a little plug again for carbonated drinks uh, not only are they, do they help you feel like full and that sort of thing, but when it comes to when it comes to uh, drinking uh, these sorts of things in general, um, or substituting uh, a food or a drink for something that maybe is a little bit more decadent, uh, maybe like a brownie platter uh, or cake or something that you know is a vice, right, and truly high in calorie, uh, low in nutritional value. What research has indicated is that our brains struggle to detect the, or care really, uh, about the flavor differences. What we really like is the act of eating that donut or treat or whatever at that time. We are very habitual creatures. And I will find myself not even being hungry but I'll be sitting on the couch and that's I, every single night at seven o'clock. I usually have a snack we're watching a true crime documentary. That's when I eat my snack. It's the same trigger, the same time, the same environment. And my brain is firing to go get a snack from the kitchen, even though my stomach doesn't need it. I'm not actually hungry. So what I have been doing and what I'm teaching a lot of my clients is instead of uh, going for that same snack or just trying to eliminate it altogether. If you feel like you don't have the willpower and the mental fatigue is too strong, just opt for something that is uh, maybe the same in quantity or similar in nature, but just has a lower, um, a lower caloric impact. An example of a, instead of a regular brownie, a fiber one brownie, or instead of uh, chocolate chip cookies, which have a score of one, one on the satiety index, meaning that they have little to no nutritional value. They 
uh, you do not feel full almost at all from them. And you can eat a ton of them and consume a ton of calories without even realizing it, right? Instead of having a standard chocolate chip cookie, we just get these little 100 calorie uh, packs of like the mini chocolate chip cookies. And they're small in, in size. And I just eat them. And I feel just fine. I, I enjoy them. They taste good. And it takes me a little bit uh, longer to consume them. But I'm satisfying that habit loop of it's time. This is the place. I want a snack. I'm just replacing the one activity and item for another. And that, that craving is satisfied otherwise. Uh, and I don't have the, the caloric impact as well. Hmm. What about doing a chocolate chip protein bar? Um, so then you're increasing your protein, which is another not hard, a difficult thing to do. And then that way you're actually, comp- you're solving two problems. One, getting enough protein Two, you know, having that same snack that you want. Um, yeah. maybe that would I, work. You know what I found? Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, uh, I, I was going to agree. I, I think that's a perfectly fine solution. Uh, in general, it's, it, Kills two birds with one stone. Again, with the weird animal killing euphemisms. I'm sorry about that. Skinning a cat. And the <laughs> You're birds. so you are so funny. I just love <laughs> your personality. <laughs> sorry, my brain just doesn't stop. So it's like it's hard for me to like, you know. Anyways, stay on course, Teddy. The point of the matter is that when it comes to um, um a protein bar, for instance, I am all for that. Get more protein, um, satisfy that craving, etc just as long as you are not sacrificing your caloric budget um, or, or the goal of energy balance, right? Like, like actually staying in a caloric deficit by adding this into your, um, your mark. So if instead of consuming, maybe every night you eat a Snickers bar um, and that's, that's going to run you what, 230 calories or something like that. Absolutely. uh, Have a protein bar that maybe is a hundred calories. You get a little protein in general, but uh, whatever gets you to the finish line of the caloric deficit, this is if you're wanting to lose body fat, of course, and satisfies the protein amount that you want. And of course, uh, makes you, uh, keeps you sane along the way. That is the goal. Like you said, eat like the person, essentially like eat like the person that you're trying to live like, right? Or what, what was the phrase that you used uh, earlier? Um, when you after you lose weight, I can't remember exactly what you said. I maintain think, it the same way you lose it. Maintain it the same way you lose it. it. Exactly. Went in and out. That's what I think is easiest. So lose it slowly and then maintain it the same way. So how can people find you? Yeah, absolutely. There's two main places. Um, my Instagram page is pretty active. You're going to find a lot of you know stories every day and that sort of thing. So that'll be at Ted Woolsey. Um, I'll, I'll put that, uh, send that over to you so you can add that to the show notes, I'm sure. And then of course we have our, our website, which is www.rbldfitness.com, uh, that you can, uh, when you speak it out, it says rebuild fitness, but again, RBLD, uh, if you want to learn more about what that means, check out the website, but that's where to find me. And I can't wait to speak with you, whoever you are out there listening to this today. Thank you so much for coming on the show. I love how your brain works. I love the research you've done. And I learned a lot of different things today that I think will help myself as well as the listeners. So thank you. Oh my gosh. Thanks so much for having me. This was a ton of fun. And I look forward to uh, hearing the episode soon. Awesome. Okay. That was super fun. I hope you enjoyed the conversation. Teddy seems like a bright young man, and I'm sure he's going to go to amazing places. So thank you so much for listening. I really hope that you learned a thing or two, and we will see you on the next show. Make it a great day. This podcast contains the opinion and thoughts of its host and guests. It is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subjects covered. All statements made on the podcast have not been evaluated by the FDA and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. If the listener requires professional assistance or advice, please contact your personal medical doctor. Both host and guests specifically disclaim any responsibility for any liability, loss, or risk 
personal or otherwise, which is incurred as a consequence directly or indirectly of the use and application of any of the contents of these episodes. Like I said, this is my opinion and I could be wrong.